Now Sweeney, Dwayne Sweeney! Sweeney's over! Can you please hand it over to your captain, Dwayne Sweeney? Welcome to Real Tales with Sweens. This episode, I catch up with current Waikato captain and Blackfern, Chelsea Alley. Chelsea has been playing rugby at provincial level for 10 seasons now and has been involved with the Blackferns since 2012. We cover some awesome topics and Chelsea shares some of her amazing experiences, from growing up in Tokoro and being the first female to play in the Waikato under-13s boys' side, holding Taylor Swift album release parties with her best friends and how important those friendships have been to keep her life balanced. Chelsea also shares her emotional call up to the Black Ferns and what it was like to walk onto Twickenham in front of 80,000 people. The pride and mana she felt performing the national anthem and haka before her international debut, the pressures that come with representing the Black Ferns in both 7s and 15s in the same year. We also discuss her current lifestyle where she balances being a teacher and a Black Fern and how important her family, especially her big brother Nate, have been for her during her career, her love of travel and much more. As always, the show notes will be posted on Instagram at Real Tales with Sweens and the website realtaleswithsweens.com. You can listen on Apple, Spotify, Google and now also available on iHeartRadio. I'm extremely grateful to Chelsea for giving up her time and I wish her and the girls all the best for the Farah Palmer Cup. Enjoy the podcast. Cool, I'm just sitting here with Chelsea Alley, Black Fern number 173. G'day Chelsea. Sweet, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> I'll start off with how I know Chelsea. So in 2017 when I came back from Japan, Chelsea was preparing for the Rugby World Cup and in and around the stadium a lot while we were preparing for the Mitre 10 Cup. So I, I seen your, I'd seen your face before, obviously, with playing for the Black Ferns and you know, I've always sort of followed the team and been a proud New Zealander and obviously been uh, pretty invested in rugby. I've always taken an interest in, in the in the Black Ferns, so I knew who you were and um, I saw how hard you girls worked to prepare for that World Cup and obviously had an outstanding result and came back with the win. Um, and then last year we ended up in the same management team so yeah. we were I was the assistant coach for the Waikato Women's Sevens and Chelsea was our manager yes. which was a bit of a, a late call in <laughs> but I've seen your outstanding managerial skills and how good you are at planning and organizing and <laughs> and doing my research for this podcast I've actually that's quite a common theme of people is how well organized you are so no doubt we'll get into that a little bit but yeah. do you have any sort of memories of that well to be fair, my first memories of you were way before 2017. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you are um, played over 100 games for Waikato, so way back um, as a little girl, I guess I was watching you on the field. So, yeah, coming back into the gym in 2017, and um, it happened to actually be quite a lot. I, most days I would be in the gym at the same time, kind of training together um, for the season that year. So, yeah, um, seeing how hard you were still pushing at a bit of an older age, <laughs> and... Um, me coming in preparing for a World Cup, um, yeah, got to know each other and then um, obviously last year with the um, Waikato Sevens campaign, that was a pretty awesome experience, um, yeah, being on the managerial side and kind of, that was my first time actually being a manager, um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that, so yeah, happy to be on the podcast and spinning some yarns with you today, Sweets. Yeah, nah, cool, I'm real excited about this one, so... <laughs> Yeah, just on that managerial side, just before we get into things, we actually partied pretty hard after that tournament, and <laughs> we actually, I rode my scooter back here when the sun was up in the morning. I was yeah, sober when I rode my scooter, by the way. Of course. But um, yeah, you actually mentioned how much you enjoyed that, and, and you that's definitely something you'd like to do more in the future? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I've dabbled in some coaching, and um, I've kind of figured while I'm playing, um, I'm going to leave coaching till I'm finished my playing career, but um, managing's something else. You're like you're not as involved in the on-field stuff, but um, I, I love being around um, like the younger players, the younger girls coming through and um, helping out with the development um, of those players. And um, as you as you mentioned before, I kind of like um, <laughs> organizing and managing people, and I'm not sure. Um, 
my fiance would say about that, he'd probably agree. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it, and I I can definitely um, see myself kind of heading down that path or dabbling a bit bit more down the track. Yeah, yeah, no, it was cool. I yeah, I really mostly for the parties after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just such a great way to um, still be involved, eh? Like, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I I really enjoy that campaign and I really look forward to it every year now that since or I've done the last two seasons and yep. I hope that continues but yeah I really I really enjoy it and it's a great bunch of, of uh, girls to be involved with they have yep. a lot of fun and there's a lot of respect and yeah it's pretty yep. cool and it's cool for I know from um, my point of view to have someone of your caliber involved in the management group and being close and connected through playing with them in the Farah Palmer Cup um, and no doubt those younger girls do look up to you whether you know you feel that way or not like <laughs> yeah. you know as as Kiwis we're quite humble and we tend yeah. to play that down a little bit but yeah. I, I definitely see that, that there's a lot of respect for you because of what you do on the field so it's really nice uh, to have those girls or for those girls to have you around I reckon and it, it just sets a really good example so Nah, Thanks. that's cool. Well, I'll, I'll be waiting for my call up for this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have my yeah. notebook at the ready. Yeah, hopefully I don't get the sack. <laughs> no, I'm sure you won't. I um, love it. Cool. So I, I do want to go back a little bit because you grew up in, in Tokoroa and Tokoroa is just this amazing melt, melting pot of talent. Like breeding a, ground. Yeah, breeding <laughs> yeah. ground. They just keep coming. Like yeah. Some of the names of the people... You know, they come out like Richard Kahui, Quay Cooper, like they're just current ones. But it goes back, like the list is huge. huge yeah. And if you put the South Waikato into that with Potato do as well, you got Honey Hitomi, mm. Um, mm. Wayne Smith, like there's a lot of talent. That, what is it down there? Did, <laughs> was that something, yeah. sorry, was that something that you were aware of when you were growing up, that, that all yeah. this talent was in your small town of Tokoro? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm like extremely proud to be from down there. And I guess growing up, there were so many legends um, that were part of the All Blacks, all the Black Ferns, or um, playing playing around the world for different countries. And um, Tokoro is like a very proud community. And um, we really celebrate people who um, achieve high honours and stuff that, that come from our community. So definitely aware of it. Um, and yeah, I'm not 100% what it is, if it's something in the water down there or <laughs> if it's simply the fact that um, kids down there, we're encouraged to just get out, run around with the ball in our hands. And um, I guess compared to schools, other schools and cities and stuff, um, there wasn't much option when it came to sport. So it was basically either rugby or netball with a bit of football in there as well. But um, yeah, there wasn't, wasn't, I guess, much else to do. So yeah, kids yeah. kids got into rugby and there's just the good genes and yeah. the the mighty Waikato River water that <laughs> yeah. runs down there. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I always love playing in Tote. Yeah. It's it's always a hard place to play. It always has been right from, I remember going down there as a, a kid probably when I was sort of intermediate age was probably the first time we started to travel down there for rugby and I played a lot against Richard Kahui growing up mm. and we played age group rugby together right the way through into professional rugby and yeah it was always just such a hard place to play yeah. but always really enjoyable because there was so much passion like in the town like you talk about it like celebrating the success or mm. uh, the, the people just celebrate the game like there was always a big crowd it was always hard because they toot the horn at you yeah, when, you're, yeah. when you're trying to kick and all that but yeah I really really enjoyed it and awesome surfaces like yeah. the field's always really really nice yeah, one of the most underrated grounds in the Waikato, I think. And um, it's still the same, though, now. Like, you go down to watch um, the Southern United men's team play, and it's packed. Like, it's just a community event. Everyone's there cheering people on. There's still, you know, it's a cliche, but there's still the ladies in the kitchen <laughs> putting on, making sure there's good good kai for everyone after, um, after the game. There's kids running around. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just part of the town. Yeah, that's... Um, that part you mentioned there not not about ladies in the kitchen but it, <laughs> it, it, it is a little bit about that because it's about a community yeah hey, it's and you see it like um I, I'm from Warrensville in like a small mm. town and our club's successful and we always have we're not successful so much on the field with results but we're successful in the fact that we always have people at our games mm. um we still field four teams like we have a Colts and under 85s a B's and a premier team yeah um, we have awesome numbers. We have you know people that have to stand on the sideline some weeks because we have too many numbers, but it's 
because of the support of the town and mm. and it is it's a family affair when it comes to to Moranzo. and i know tokoro is very similar like yeah. you, you see the you go down there and a lot of the same names that i used to play against you see their younger brothers or mm. cousins or you know um all coming through so it's 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 very cool to see that it's so ingrained almost in the mm. culture yeah. yeah no definitely my family's all all come from there and um, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm really proud to come from there, and I still love going back home. Yeah. They still celebrate all our successes, as um, you know, we we um, make different teams and stuff. So, yeah. No, nah, that's cool. Yeah, obviously, you're very proud of where you come from, and as I understand, in doing this research for the podcast and asking a few people about you, they said that you oh, have no. a very close um, <laughs> group of friends from Tokyo oh, yeah. that you're still well connected with, and and Morgs's name came up a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah. How important are they to you, like your your close friends from home? Yeah, my close friend group is hugely important to me. Like, um, obviously I spend a lot of time in rugby circles and I'm always on tour, I'm training with the team every night and I've got really close rugby mates um, who, are, who are also really important to me and they're some of my best friends. But um, having my really close group of friends from Tokoroa, I believe is what's kind of helped keep me grounded. Um, I still spend so much time with them. They're, they're the friends I've had from intermediate right up until now. We're still best friends. We travel together, um, get together whenever we want, uh, whenever we can, sorry. And um, they're, the, they're the friends that wherever I'm playing in New Zealand with the Black Ferns or with Waikato or even with my club team, they come on the sideline, usually hungover. <laughs> <laughs> they make signs, like they're really extra. Um, yeah. And they're just my go-to. I can talk to them about anything. And I honestly think it's so um, it's been so important for me to have that group of friends outside of rugby because as you would know too, Swedes like rugby can really take over your life. So um, yeah, just having having that group there to yeah keep me grounded and um, talk to about things that aren't to do with rugby has has been huge. Yeah, um, and that's that's something that I figured out at a pretty young age too because I kind of. Well, I went to Hamilton Boys High, so I lost a little bit of connection with, mm. um, I guess, my hometown friends that I grew up with. But once I finished high school and went back, started playing club rugby for Morinsville, started to spend more time with my friends back home again. Mm. Once my sort of rugby career took off and I started to play super rugby and I think I might have been sort of 21 at the time, I remember having a pretty hard conversation with one of my best friends. He was one of my groomsmen. Um a guy called Norm or Adam Norman and there, there was two Adams in the group it was always Norm and Stewie after their last name so Adam Norman Adam Stewart and I remember my good mate Norm was just he made a comment to me like Sween you need to stop being a dickhead and hang out mm. with the boys and it was it was so true because I'd just gone off on this completely different mm. tangent and I was playing professional rugby and it was all I guess, you know, like cameras and lights and the rest of it. And I thought, you know, this is awesome. But just that one conversation that he had with me at at like 21 and I'm quite a sensitive person. I really took that to heart and I was like, oh, am I a dickhead? And I took a really hard look at myself and I was Mm. like, yeah, actually I am. I'm neglecting Mm. where I've come from Mm. in terms of my friends. So, and they've they've been awesome for me. Like the whole way through my career, they've been there. They've been that constant. Like they're just... They're so grounding. They give me shit all the time. Yeah. You know, if I make a mistake, that you know, they they give me shit. But they're the first ones there to celebrate when things go well. Yeah. Um, I remember I got to share my um fiftieth game with them for Waikato, and they were like involved with the team. They were always in our team functions, and yeah, they've just been so good for me mm. through my career. And I think it's a really important thing for, I suppose, aspiring professional athletes to have that grounding something yeah. separate because it is like you say it's so consuming yeah like and it's very Definitely. easy just to um just get consumed with professional rugby or or rugby in general and then you're only one injury away from spending possibly a year or the rest of your life mm. out of the game mm. and that that rugby circle moves on it moves so mm. fast and you know, if you're relying solely on your group of friends within that group, they ain't going to have time for you yeah. because rugby doesn't stop. Like, they're going to keep going. They're going to be off on tours and the rest of it, and it, you can get pretty lonely if, yeah, if you don't have that grounding group around you. Oh, 100% I feel that. Like, the, they've been there through the best and the worst 
moments. Um, I've had rugby friends through different kind of stages of my career, and 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 still I say like those girls are still really I'm really close with them. But yeah, that group has seen me um, before rugby as well, so um, they know what I enjoy and um, <laughs> other stuff I get up to in that. So <laughs> yeah. so yeah. yeah. Nah, cool. We'll dive into that a little bit, and we might as well <laughs> go into that oh. now. So something in doing the the research is around and with those girls in Tokoro is <laughs> is Taylor Swift release oh, parties or you get, no. is that is that something that happens in I don't, does it happen in Tokoro? It like, did, it yes. Did? Yeah. Growing up, yes, yeah. a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so obviously yeah, I play rugby. I'm um, I'm tough out on the field and stuff, but um I yeah. like Taylor Swift too by Thanks, the way. Thanks, so, Wings. Yeah. I, I get given a lot of heat for that but oh, you know really? what I'm proud yeah good <laughs> yeah we um we celebrate <laughs> coming um uh, been to a few concerts <clears throat> eight eight yeah how many times has she been to New Zealand she's been twice but done six concerts all up here oh yeah yeah, yeah. so I've been and to you Sarah went to all Aussie. six of them yeah. Yeah. yeah and then went to Aussie as well and with Aussie my friends well. Morgan and co yeah cool yeah. what was that like oh awesome we were still at high school so oh real yeah yeah, that's... any parents go with you? Nah, nah. <laughs> just a girls' trip in oh, sixth wait. form. Yeah, <laughs> sixth form. Yeah, we're never told. Like yeah. 16, 17? we were dedicated Swifties. I tell yeah. you, yeah, yeah. I think we were seventeen or so. So, so what yeah, happened there? Did you have like ho- Did you get a to, hotel? Yeah, we did. To be honest, I didn't even know how to catch a taxi at sixteen. <laughs> I know. It was and an you come adventure. from Tokoroa. Like... Yeah, honestly, people from Taik are street smart. Yeah, yeah. We can handle ourselves yeah, wherever. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the start, the Taylor Swift thing, it was like, yeah, let's go on a trip with our mates. Let's go to this concert. And then it's kind of become like um, just another excuse, I guess, to get get us back together and, um, yeah, ha- have a few beers and listen to some music and go to a concert and stay in the city for the night. Cool. That's <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. And your parents were all good with you going to Aussie at 16. Uh, I guess the type of teenager I was, my mum... <laughs> Didn't really have have Never a say, say, but yeah. yeah, I was just doing what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was good. Yeah, we well, can be a little bit bossy, as I've seen when yes. you're a manager. Wow. When you put your foot down, you get what you want. <laughs> yeah, and I think Sims will vouch for that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he definitely will. <laughs> That's cool. So you you obviously um, have a massive love of travel too, and that was something else that came out, and that's how I suppose I kind of came to learn about your organisational skills and there's been mentions of um, awesome stopovers and and tours and things you've organised for some of your teammates after Blackburn's tours and stuff like that. Is that, you love travel? Love it, yeah. That's where I guess I'm always so grateful for rugby because um, growing up, like, you get to travel so much with it, with rugby, you know, and after a big tour... Every single tour I would stay on at the end and just um, travel either around that place that we were already playing at or um, if we had a stopover, we had a stopover once in San Fran. Um, Spent a bit of time there. Um, And yeah, I also love an itinerary. So (laughs) my teammates love me because they know if I'm going on a trip with them, I'll plan everything. I'll book good hotels in the best places and um, organise everything down to the T. So yeah, yeah, I guess that's my... um, the manager side coming back out of me, but um, yeah, tra- travel um, travel was a big part of my life, obviously, until <laughs> earlier this year. Um, yeah. yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to get out and do some more. But um, yeah, I haven't even touched on um, a quarter of the kind of places I want to get to. So cool. Yeah. Um, do you do much within New Zealand? Like, have you done much uh, travel? Yeah, I've done a, done a bit, like done around down the South Island. Um, there's still a lot more I do want to do though. Yeah. Um, and I've got a, we've got a bye weekend coming up in three weekends, heading back down south again. Oh, cool. Have a look around and eat a few more Ferg burgers, probably. So, oh, yeah, 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 down to Queenstown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a pretty cool place. It's not, it's like it's not even New Zealand. Though. Oh, no, no, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're pretty lucky. I think we're extremely lucky with the current, I suppose, travel climate and us not, well, basically the whole world being shut down that yeah. we are here in New Zealand and we have such a beautiful... I guess backyard that sometimes and it's easy like I did it like you take it for granted and oh, it's all it's, it's sort of taken away almost and yeah. that for me that was when I went to Japan like I just longed for home so yeah. much and yeah. 
it reignited my passions for fishing and hunting in the outdoors again because yeah. I guess I kind of got a little bit complacent with it because I'd grown up with it all the time with with dad and, and my brothers and having three younger brothers that's you know what we mm. did and we lived for it and then it you know I'd almost I suppose got to a point where it didn't have the fizz that it had when we were younger and yeah. then I guess for me losing that for like six years yeah. um yeah just reignited that and I suppose hopefully everyone's taking advantage now of getting mm. out into our I guess our own backyard and with not being able to travel overseas yeah well I haven't done like I have I've never lived overseas yet it's always been in my plans um but obviously with uh, being in the black friends and stuff going going and living overseas to do something mm. would um you don't know how it would work out if you'd um mm. make the team again if you came back so I've kind of chosen to try and keep my momentum yep. in the team with that um but well, it's still, a, a still professional sports are a short window of your life too isn't exactly, it and if yeah. you're if you're aiming to achieve then you really do have to commit to it oh 100 percent, yeah so that that's kind of been my reasoning um i will i will do it um yeah. one day whether it's going to be with coaching overseas or maybe managing overseas <laughs> um teaching yeah i don't know but i'll definitely go do do a stint overseas, yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. And hopefully the women's game gets to the point where, yeah. you know, there is chances for you to go and play overseas and, yeah. and earn a living um, like there is in the men's game. Cause it, it's heading yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah it is. Definitely, it definitely so. is. And it's, yeah, I suppose it's for us, for the, the men's side of the game, mm. it, it's progressed because it's been around for longer in professional yeah. terms, but it the women's game's definitely tracking in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. It's getting yeah. there, so yeah. I'll be I'll be looking out for opportunities. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, rugby now. So I do want to talk about, I guess, your transition because you started at a, a, similar to myself, started at a young age mm. in terms of going into Premier Rugby, playing Provincial Rugby, and then into the Black Ferns, which we'll, we'll get to. But... I did get asked. I did get told to ask about your first game for Varsity and your pre-game meal oh, no. that you had, and a couple of yes. senior players weren't too happy. I yes. understand. Wow, let's set the scene first, right? So high school rugby, um, obviously like a seventh former down in Toke. Um, I didn't have to do much training or game prep to um, do well on the field, so yeah. I got quite the shock when I came into <laughs> women's rugby, and I was I was probably good. Um, I was probably um, had a bit of a big head coming out of high school, um, and then yeah into women's rugby, and I joined varsity club, and I was playing alongside Honey Hedemir, Victoria Grant, Teresa Tatamaki, um, and I showed up to the first game, first off severely hungover <laughs> from the night before. And um, I just did my usual, what I do on the way to school in the morning. And I stopped and I got a pie for breakfast. <laughs> and then I wondered why halfway through the second half I was um, in agonising pain and cra- with cramp yeah. <laughs> on the field. Um, yeah, so I have to say after that game I got a massive rack up from, <laughs> from the senior players in the team. And... Um, yeah, I guess I guess from that moment on, I kind of um, started trying to look after myself a bit better and realizing that I couldn't just do that if I wanted to play that next level. Yeah, if you don't know, you don't know, do mm. you? And I guess coming in, like you said, there you're playing high school rugby in Tokoroa, yeah, and then yeah, you're, yeah. all of a sudden you're playing with you just listed black ferns. Yeah, like, it's a very big jump very quickly. So oh, huge learning you know, it's curve. A, yeah, it's a fast learning curve. Um, but as I understand now, that's something that came through through my research as well, is how good you are and how disciplined you are with your food and with your training. So obviously you've learned that along mm. the way. And, and how much, I guess, value do you put on that? Yeah, well, I guess I was really lucky. Like, um, you know, being a schoolgirl and then coming into that environment with that calibre of players who were already performing at a top level. I learned so much from those girls and... I just watched them and how they carried themselves, how that, how hard they trained, what kind of food they'd be eating before and after games, because I had no idea. Mm. I was just so green. And then um, I went and did a, a sports science degree and I did extra papers in nutrition because I was genuinely wanting to understand how the body works and how I could best fuel myself. Like I always had a dream of being a black fern and I knew the way that I was carrying on was not going to um, help me get there. So... I literally did everything I could to to learn how to how to become one um, mm. 
everything from strength and conditioning training to nutrition and and yeah just having those people around me to kind of help guide me and push me really helped um I am a bit of a stickler with nutrition now um I place a huge emphasis on it in my life um simply because I've I've done a lot of trial and error over the years um I've been around a while now and I I just know what works for my body I know what helps me perform and um I know some some girls some players um nutrition and food doesn't really affect their training and performance as much as me but um I know what works for me and um I stick to that pretty hard if I want to maintain that kind of top level yeah all right so I do want to jump back a little bit now (laughs) because you mentioned there um obviously coming in at a young age but playing growing up playing rugby in Tokoroa I imagine there wasn't a lot of girls playing the game at that time were you playing with the boys yeah I played with the boys um right up until I actually played in the Waikato under 13 boys team first oh, yeah. girl so right from the age of that's a um, cool story yeah, yeah I was four when I played for the first time I followed my older brother Nate um he used to beat him up in the backyard too yeah know. yeah we had a few good rumbles in the backyard but <laughs> and over playstation yeah, yeah. controllers <laughs> He never shared with me, so I yeah. had to teach him a few lessons. Yeah, so he got punched in the nose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he did tell you that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I was the only girl playing in all the grades growing up. Um, and back then, yeah, like compared to now, obviously, there's lots of girls running around out there, which is awesome. But back then, there was none. There was just me. So um, there were a few um, kind of... Uh, challenges I ran into with that, with parents not wanting me to play and um, kind of old guys on boards and unions saying that I shouldn't be playing and stuff. But um, yeah, my kind of comeback for that was I just chucked a headgear on and kind of tried to not let anyone know that I was even a girl in the field. So yeah, yeah I loved growing up playing with the boys and yeah, it's good. Because your brothers are older too, so did you play up an age as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, I always played up one age yeah, with yeah. my brother, yeah. Wow, oh, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. an awesome story. I was, I just, I just grew way faster than the boys too. I was yeah. always like the tallest and biggest player, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nate said that you were, haven't grown much since your early teens. Nah. Really, you've sort of been that, as tall as you are. Yep, yeah, yeah no, I, I grew up real early, so. Yeah, I always had a bit of an advantage height-wise and size-wise over the boys even. Yeah. Until a certain age, obviously. Yeah, so did being, I suppose, um, more physically developed earlier, mm. do, do you think that helped or hindered you later on when you were in your career when everyone else, I guess, caught up? Yeah, no, I think it would have helped just simply because um, being able to be physical at a young age, it helped me to make those rep teams, which then gave me better coaching, um, gave me confidence, which we know is so important in the game. Um, and I guess helped me get uh, like recognised um, younger and, and quicker. So, yeah, I mean, others caught up, but, um, yeah, uh, natural talent kind of gets you so far, and then after that it's how hard you want to keep working. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's real interesting to see how much you've put in, like, because mm. I, I can see it in the way that you train, because I've seen it firsthand, um, how much you put into into it, but hearing you talk about, you know, studying sports science and mm. taking nutrition papers and really trying to, that's next level in terms of yeah. intelligence and, I guess, mindset and drive to get to where you wanted to get to. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of, I guess it's my personality. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I like to be educated on what yeah. I'm doing and um, I like to understand things and Probably my coaches will tell you too, like, I want to know why I'm doing something. I'm not just going to do something yeah. because it's going to look nice or um, it's it's, an, it's a good looking drill. I want to know exactly why I'm doing it, who exactly I'm holding, yeah. what the next three phases are going to look like. <laughs> I'm quite meticulous and all that and, and that's with everything in my life. So, yeah, with the nutrition, with the training, I'll ask yeah. my trainer, why am I doing this exercise? Yeah. So getting an understanding for me and educating myself has been um, really important for my career. Yeah, I think that's probably why you've stayed in the game mm. so long. Like you've been playing at that level now for ten seasons this year. Yeah, so FPC? this season our first yeah. game's on Saturday, and it'll be the start of my tenth FPC year. Yes, yeah. and you're twenty seven, so yeah. already played ten se- <laughs> ten seasons at that level. It's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, I 
I spoke about this with, on another podcast I did with a, an adventure kayaker of all things, and oh, yeah. we talked a lot about the attention to detail, and it's amazing how many successful people in life, whether it be sport or business or or anything really parenting, mm. it's the attention to detail, the yeah. people that have that yeah. and really want to understand why they're doing things, it, yeah. it tends, tends to be the people that succeed the most, and it, it's definitely not the most talented people that mm. aren't willing to to really understand why they're doing it mm. it's always the people that want to understand why whether whether they have a high level of talent or not they find a way to yeah. do what they want to do yeah like i'm not i'm not the fastest person or the strongest person i don't have big wax or anything <laughs> you know but yeah so i can't kind of get by on on that and make teams because of that one bit of razzle i have um because i just simply don't have it mm. so yeah for me it's it's that that i guess gives me gets me to that next yeah, level yeah it gives you yeah. the edge yeah it's very similar to me like yeah. oh, everything i have in, in my game is all self-taught or mm. taught or you know things i picked up along the way from different yeah. people and and um you know grateful for the environments that i've been in and yeah, yeah it's definitely yeah i didn't have a lot of natural talent apart from i suppose good hand eye coordination yeah, yeah. Um, never been really fast um yeah. been okay yeah never been super fit either but yeah just worked i guess really hard on yeah. on all those little things and tried to pick up as much as i could from mm. from the people that were around me yeah i think the ability to pick up something new from each person you come across um or in each environment you're in is huge um because there's always a little gold nugget in, yeah. in, in whatever team or whatever person you're dealing with. Yeah. So you've yeah, been able to take all those gold nuggets, I guess, and and use them. Yeah, I suppose that's just have been open minded, eh, to, mm, yeah, to different things. Because you know, I'm 36 now. Jeez, that's old. Hopefully. But I, I still, I still um, learn things off guys at club rugby because yeah. you know they're like 18 year old kid that's you know growing up in Morrinsville mm. and might not have had the best coaching or schooling, mm. but he'll do something a certain way, and I, I'm really intrigued for, for the reason why, and I, I I really enjoy those conversations and trying to learn see what angle he's coming from mm. with his mindset, and you're like, oh, that's something I could do, yeah. or that's something that I could add to my game. Mm. Yeah, so I, I do. I really well, enjoy that side of it. And I think it helps you have a long career when you're open-minded as yeah, well. Yeah, well, I've seen some of the best kind of players kind of die out and fizzle out simply because they they kind of think that they've made it. They think they kind of know it all. They're not open, especially when new coaches come in. So, yeah, I'm always really mindful of that. Like, you want to keep learning. You want to keep getting better. So, um, other people always have something to offer you. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen that too through yeah. my career. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. I we'll go back to um varsity because mm. I wanna talk about these up. Yeah, yeah these <laughs> up. I wanna talk about the two thousand and fourteen season. So I took Great with, season. Yeah, great season. So I talked with Teresa um to Tamaki on her podcast and about the 2014 season was something she mentioned mm. and she said that anyone that was involved in that team of that year um, with Waikato as well will remember it forever. Do you, mm. Can you share your experiences of that season? Yeah, definitely. So um, Varsity, I think, was three or four years old then as a club that Teresa and, and a few others started, Victoria Grant and Honey and Mazza and co. And... Um, We'd been building each year, we'd actually been playing in the Auckland competition. So we'd travel to Auckland every Saturday um, and play against the Auckland teams up there. And um, I think we'd finish fourth, third, second, and then the 2014 season, um, we went up and we won the comp, which was just awesome. Like, um, I was still quite quite young then, and um, it was just such an awesome experience. And then that varsity team actually pretty much became our Waikato FPC team. So yeah, we, we played all around the country against other teams and we actually made the final that year for FPC. Um, we were coached by, um, I know you spoke about it with T, but a guy called Reuben Samuel, who was absolutely instrumental in, in women's rugby in the Waikato. So um, yeah, definitely a season I will never forget. Um, and that is actually the highest that Waikato women's has ever finished on oh, the yeah. FPC table. So yeah. yeah, this year we're gunning to top that, but... Yeah. Um, as it stands at the moment, that, that that's the most successful season. So, I spoke about it on tees, but I see so much respect in the 
and the girls mm. for Ruben and for yeah. what he's done. And I just find that like awesome. Like I, I, I have that relationship with some coaches that mm. I've, I've had in the past and it, you know, I hope that people can see the amount of respect I have for them, mm. the way I can see it come out of you girls. Like it's just, it's so evident whenever he's around and yeah. I just find it, yeah, it's, you can definitely tell that he's had a massive impact on a on a lot of girls. Yeah, in, I, in I, the have, Waikato. I have so so much respect for that guy. Um, he he like fought for us, you know. When before women's rugby, you know, the last few years it's blowing up a bit, but um, he really got it off the ground in Waikato, and he came up across some obstacles in trying to do that. But he always pushed through. Like there was nothing he wouldn't do to. He saw the talent in the girls and saw the potential in the not only the players but in the women's game. Um, and yeah, I I will always feel like I'm in debt to what he's done, not only for me but for the game. Um, yeah. And yeah, just just a lot of respect. I know I know I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of yeah. women in the Waikato when I yeah. say that. No, it's cool. It's so um, and it's awesome to have this platform to share that out eh? because you don't yeah. always get the chance to I suppose tell people. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and and for people, I guess a I suppose a wider audience to mm. to have. The understanding of what someone like that has done for mm. such a big group. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've there's been little tokens of appreciation I've shown him along the way. Like, I've given him um, test jerseys and stuff like that. But yeah, there's yeah, it's good to kind of thank him on a on a bit of a and with a bit of an audience as well. I yeah, guess. yeah, no, it's <laughs> cool. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, so I do want to talk about your Black Ferns introduction. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you talk to me about that? I understand it was at a young age. Yeah, my yeah. first year yeah. got called over. Yeah, so um, 2012, um, two years out of high school, so I think I was 19. Stopped eating pies before games? That's why <laughs> Only just. just yeah. Still on a Sunday morning, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so the Black Ferns were touring in England at the time, and I was still real young, um, I had been spoken to by the Black Fence coach earlier that year, um, had seen me play a little bit of club. Who was the coach at that stage? Um, Brian Evans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I knew I was kind of in the mix, and I went to a few camps and played a few in the trial games. But yeah. What was that like at oh, that age? Like, it was scary. <laughs> yeah, and just the, you would, there would have been people that you would admire. Oh, like, like yeah. I, I just watched the 2010 Women's World Cup, yeah. and all those players, like, I was at high school, and they were just my idols, and yeah. then... It was only a year or two later, and I'm like playing on the same team as them or against them in a trial yeah. game, and yeah, it was an unreal feeling. Um, so so yeah, in my mind, I kind of thought I'm here to make up numbers. I know they're they're always looking for the fu- like future yep. players and the younger players. So I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> and then anyway, one uh, morning, the girls were already touring over there. Um, I was just laying in bed and I was about to get up and mow the lawns. <laughs> and then I get this phone call and it's um, Brian from England. Yeah. And he says to me, can you be on a plane at five o'clock tonight in Auckland? And I was like, what? <laughs> just like feeling, I was just numb, really. Like there were so many emotions. Like, I was overwhelmed and anxious and I didn't know if it was real. Um, it was crazy. So yeah, that day was just hectic. Um, I had to run around. I had to go pick up my kit and then um, be up in Auckland by a certain amount of time. And I was, I was still young. I'd never travelled overseas by myself. Um, and I was so lucky that my brother Nate, who I'm so close with, actually got on a plane with me that afternoon. Oh, did he? Yep. He yeah. cancelled all his work. And he was just like, there's no way I'm, I'm missing coming with you. Oh, um, wicked. So, he, so cool. Yeah, it was so cool. So he got on a plane with me. Um, got off on the other side. I was in shorts and a singlet. <laughs> <laughs> Good old tote girl. And... Um, Got off to about oh, negative 10 or something in, in London. And that very night in London, the Black Ferns were playing against England um, at Twickenham. And we actually played what after... What a place, though. Oh, honestly. We actually played after the All Blacks versus England. Oh, yeah. And it was the test that England beat the All Blacks at Twickenham. And it was sold out. Yeah. So I don't know what the capacity is, about 60,000 or something. I think it might be 80. 80, I yeah. think it's 80, it, yeah. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah, but you know when you don't strip for a team, so you're yep. a DD, you go out and you set up the hit shields and or the balls and the cones for the warm-up. And so I went out onto Twickenham, jet-lagged as, <laughs> um, just joined the Black Ferns over there um, while the All Blacks were playing England. And when I went out onto the field, England scored a try. 
So the crowd just like oh. goes crazy. <laughs> And I'm out there and I just got so overwhelmed. I just started crying. Like I was just, I didn't know how I got there. It was just the most unreal feeling and I will never forget that moment. I didn't play that tour. Um, I was basically there just to learn and stuff. Um, I made my debut the following year, but that that there is, um, yeah, something that will stick with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah. How cool, well, cool's probably not the right word. There's probably so many <laughs> the, like better words than that, but... Like, what what was it like for you? I suppose the, that moment was so special and amazing. Like, I got mm. goosebumps listening to that yeah. story. But to spend that time with the team after, at that age, and then progress into playing the next year, which mm. we'll talk about in a minute, but how important was that little period to be there, be immersed in, and I suppose that, that environment, how yeah. important was that for you moving forward, do you feel? Look, I think I was so lucky. Like, not many girls get to do that. It was almost like you hear the All Blacks, they take apprentices type yep. thing. It, it kind of felt like I was that. I was um, like an apprentice, and I just got to... I knew going over I probably wasn't going to play. I was just there for, like, extra, extra cover. But um, it was just so good to sit back and see how girls prep for trainings, how they prep for games at a professional level. Um, you know, I got to see hucker practices and start to learn it and... Um, just see how a professional rugby team operates. This is me coming out of high school, like I've got no idea. So, um, yeah, being able to see that before having the actual pressure of preparing to play myself was massive. Yep. And not only that, but I arrived in my hotel room and you know what it'd be like, but I got my first ever kit out with any <laughs> stuff. And I, I think I cried then too. It was yeah. just like, oh my goodness. So I got the Black Ferns kit, even though I wasn't playing. Um, and that there also, I think, is gave me like three times more drive to be yeah. there again the next year. Like there was no way after that I was going to miss out. So yeah. yeah, that was huge. Did Who did you room with? Who was your first roommate? Do you remember? Um, Emma Jensen. Oh, Emma Jensen. Yeah, She's legend. A legend. So, yeah, so she was on 49 uh, test caps when she retired. Yeah. So, yeah, I got to room with her and she taught me so much. Yeah. Um, such, I a, to, such an awesome person. Was, uh, she was based here in Hamilton working for oh. Oakley when I went through the academy. True. We used to go to goal, we used to goal kick practice together. Oh, wow. Yeah, when yeah. I first came out of high school. So. Yeah. Early, like 2003 yeah. through to maybe 2004, five, yeah. yeah, when she was based here before. And, yeah, we spent a lot of time. To, she used to train with us in the academy. Yeah. And, yeah, she was. She used to carve us up. We used She's to play awesome. conditioning games and she used to step all the boys. Yeah, and you know, all... like those older players in the team, though, that um, they don't guard their knowledge. They want to yeah. pass it down. They want to share it. Yeah. There's a few girls like that um, that have really stood out to me. Um when I was a young player and she was one of them and she kind of taught me how I want to be when I'm one of the older players in the team with young girls coming in. So yeah, I was really lucky with that yeah. whole tour, that whole experience. Yeah, that mm. was the same uh, for me. So I played for Waikato when I was still at high school yeah, yeah. and I remember my first roommate, it, was, it must be something they do. I was with yeah. Todd Miller. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's funny because yeah, I was just like in awe. I was like, yeah. oh my God, it's Todd Miller. And he was like, he, you know, later on and even last year we were talking to each other and he's like, yeah, I remember you were just this young kid yeah. and all you did was ask question after yeah. question after question. <laughs> what what was this game like? What was that game like? I remember you scoring this try here. He's yeah. like, you knew more about me than I knew about myself. But it was just, I was such fan a fan. Yeah, <laughs> like proper yeah. fan hard. Yeah. Like I was, yeah, I just remember just being in awe of these guys like they there's so many of the guys in the team at that stage that mm. had been All Blacks or were, you know, current All Blacks. It was, um, yeah, it was so cool. Like, yeah. I, yeah, I still buzz thinking about it now. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, pretty lucky. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> cool. So do you want to talk about your debut for the Black Ferns and who was that against? Yeah, I can um, I can remember it because it was all of about a minute and a half, oh, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was on the bench. So yeah. um, the thing that... I remember the most, well, the couple things. Um, I got my jersey presented to me by Tana Umanga, oh, which was awesome because cool. he was, like, obviously a legend and one of my idols growing up. And then the next thing I remember was that actually before the game, I was way more nervous about doing the haka than actually playing. Yeah. Like, because you don't want to stuff that up, right? Yeah. There's so much <laughs> mana and, and stuff in there. So, um, yeah, 
once I got through the hacker and didn't didn't stuff it up on live yeah. TV, um, I focused on the game. But um, again, I think being being able to be on the bench first and kind of take it all in, and then um, get my cap. Can I get that out the way? The first cap running on the field was pretty cool. Um, yeah, but my favourite part actually of that whole experience it was it was at Eden Park against England, um, and it was doing the anthem. Um, it's just something you watch on TV. Cry? Yeah, I yeah. pulled my eyes out. I was like, I, I don't cried care. Cried every time that I, I, I thought. New Zealand. Yeah, I thought yeah. you know I could try and hold it in and act yeah, tough, but at the same, same time I was like, I'm so <laughs> proud, and my family was in the crowd, and my friends, yeah. that group of friends I t- talked about. Um, and it's just like a special moment. Could so. you see them? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could that see makes them it even with worse, their signs. <laughs> yeah, and I was like trying to look in the sky, and get rid of it, but I was just yeah. like, oh, yeah. yeah. So it's a special moment, and yeah. yeah, I don't think you can ever really explain it to anyone when you you yeah. got the black jersey on with the fern on your chest, and yeah. you know about all the sacrifices and stuff you've made to get there. Yeah, it's. Um, I spoke to Anton about it when when yeah. I had Anton on. And there's obviously that iconic moment of him yeah. letting out that roar and beating his chest after the hucker. Yeah. And he doesn't even remember that. But it is very similar to you. It's mm. just like once that hucker was done, like it was like, whoa, this is about to happen. Yeah. Like I'm going to be an all black. So yeah. like, and I remember the same thing when I played for New Zealand Māori for the first time. And mm. I was on the bench also. Um, but I just remember like we practiced so hard, like that hucker and, just wanted to do it justice yeah. and then got the hucker right and I was just like you know, it was almost like a sense of like yeah. you know I was so nervous about it but then got it um, and now you got to do the other thing you came here to do yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. now we got to play <laughs> yeah but I just remember yeah once once I finished that hucker I was like well this is mm. this is gonna happen like yeah. hope, you know I was obviously hopeful that I was gonna get on but yeah, yeah and then got managed to play and yeah it was, mm. those are definitely moments that stick with you yeah yeah definitely uh, that's cool. Um, I do want to talk about, so you have played 7s and 15s yes. um, for the Black Ferns. And I, from what I understand, is you always wanted to play 15s. Yes. Like you didn't want to be a 7s player. Not really, no. I mean, the, the law of the Olympics and stuff kind of does almost want to pull you that way. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to be picked up to go on a couple tours with New Zealand 7s. Yeah, but for me, um, I found it quite hard that one season that I did play both 7s and 15s because as a player, um, you've got two coaching groups there and you've got one coaching group wanting to wanting, to, wanting you to get trimmer, faster, fitter and then you've got one coaching group wanting you to put on muscle and put on size and work on completely different Our things. Our careers so similar. Honestly, it was... It was um, that season for me was actually really tough mentally. Yeah. Um, I probably had the worst kind of, I guess, fall that I've had that, that year. That was in, at the beginning of 2014. Um, and, yeah, I, I went through a lot of things that year with, with non-selection and trying to please too many different people at once. And uh, I really let rugby consume me that year. Um, so it was at the end of, after touring with the New Zealand Sevens and... Um, the misselection and stuff that I just decided I needed to focus on on one part um, of the game, and that was 15s. I'd always loved 15s and, and growing up wanting to be an All Black yeah. <laughs> or a Black Fern. Um, yeah, that's where I kind of saw my skill set being, being better used. Um, I was never super fast, or I didn't, as I said before, I didn't really have any razzle or anything. So, um, yeah. Uh, I chose 15 and that's all I've, I've done ever since. I'll just stick to being a manager at 7s, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, yeah, I, like I just said there, like our careers are so similar, like yeah. sitting here listening to this, but I was in the exact same situation. Mm. So in 2006, I played 7s. Yeah. Um, and I was a contracted player. Mm. And then it, at the same time, I got called into the Chiefs. Mm. So I was going to these sevens camps and Gordon Titchens wanted me under 90 kilos, oh, yeah, which right. I hadn't been under 90 kilos since I was like 15. Mm. Um, so I was on this really strict diet. I was doing extra training, extra running. Mm. And then I was going back to the Chiefs when I wasn't in, because back then we used to do a week's training camp and then we would tour for two weeks. Yeah, and right. then we had to self-train in between tournaments. So 
in that self training window, I was training with the Chiefs full time, yeah. and then I would get released, go to camp, mm. go to seventh. So Chiefs were trying to put weight on me, and yeah, then I feel you because yeah. they were like, "Oh, well, if you're <laughs> going to play for us, you're going to play in the midfield, and you can't play yeah. at that weight. You're just going to get beaten up." Yeah. And then it wasn't actually until I the seventh season because I I kind of yeah I was getting pushed and pulled in all different directions and. Yeah, it was, it was difficult, really difficult and really draining mentally. Mm. Like, I, I feel like I was probably in a pretty similar place to you. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I went and played club rugby after the seven circuit was finished, um, preparing for Air New Zealand Cup it was back then, and that was ended up being the year that we won it for mm. Waikato. But I went and played club rugby, and I'd lost everything that I was good at. Yeah. So I, I was never going to get... I guess small enough or light enough that I was going to be rapid quick. Yeah. But, and I didn't, I actually got slower. Like I got, I wasn't as explosive, mm. but I could run all day, but I wasn't fast enough to run around people. Yeah. And I'd lost my ability to break tackles. Mm. So, yeah, it was like real, I suppose at that point, I realized like, well, something's got to change. Yeah. And they hammered me in the gym all preseason. Yeah. And, yeah, I think I might have put on like seven kilos in about three weeks. Like, just because, yeah, I, st- I was, like, at a real bad point with the yeah. sevens. Like, I wasn't eating and, yeah. oh, and all yeah. sorts trying to keep my right. weight down, and it was, wasn't was healthy. And uh, I actually felt my performances start to deteriorate. But I was lucky enough, Kev McCoy, the physio, he actually started, he had my back and started um, lying at my weigh-ins. Oh, I think yeah, for the sevens. Yeah. So, like, Titch thought I was 89 kilos, but I was like 95 and a half yeah. or something but <laughs> yeah it was just all perception yeah. uh, but he just knew how hard I was doing it and mm. he actually let me he was like the you can't sustain this like mm. it, he I guess he identified that I was in a pretty unhealthy situation and, yeah, and he I, had my back <laughs> I think it's really tough like for young athletes you know you're getting pressure put on you by coaches and you want to make it so bad mm. like you're training to you're not training for fun you're training to make a team and when you're getting told figures and numbers to be at you fixate on them mm. and I found that in that that particular season in 2014 um I fixated on getting my skin folds down and my body weight lower and um maybe getting a better yo-yo score or bronco or whatever and I actually lost my love for the game that yeah. year like my passion I was just I wasn't in a, in a good space at all um and I, w- I was still young and that kind of season as well I I kind of pulled back from hanging out with my friends because I don't want to go out drinking mm. and then eating bad. You lose bad. the balance of life. Lose, I lost balance so hard um, that year. It was it was terrible. But then looking back, I think it's one of the best things that that's happened to me. Like in terms of figuring out that balance. But you're exactly right. Like, and it's not like coaches do it to you on purpose. Um, no, they want they, what's best yeah, for you. Yeah. But the, all these internal. Well, they have a goal that they're, yeah. they're looking at. Yeah. All these internal battles you fight um, as a, as a young athlete. Um, and now it's good because there's so much more support around it. But when you're young, you don't know how to use that support or what's there or what's available. So, um, yeah, that was a big big learning curve for me um, that year. And, and um, yeah, I kind of try and look out for that those kind of signs in the young athletes these days as well because I know what kind of pressure they yeah. can be under. So Yeah, how, how cool is that though, eh, as yeah. like a senior player? That's one part I do really enjoy yeah. now is that I, I can – almost see things unfolding mm. in terms of like off field dynamics and that because I've been there, I've been through it. So you, Definitely. I really enjoy being able to impart my, I guess for a better word, like wisdom mm. on the younger players. Because you can tell when somebody's not in a good space or their performance hasn't been going well and you know when it's a good time to step in yeah. and be like, it's all right, mate. Like, you know, don't worry about that. We'll just focus on this. Look yeah. at working on this area. Do you, what do you need a hand with? Like, I really, I love that part of the game now yeah, at, at my age. And, and I had a few people that did that for me when I was yeah. younger, which I'm so grateful for. Yeah, the classic thing that I see a lot of now in our young girls um, is they do everything that they believe is, is right and what the coaches want to see. And that is training a lot, like, like, I'm a big stickler for never missing training, and that's all good. But when these girls are missing um, their families' weddings and birthdays and funerals and that type of thing because they can't be seen to giving anything less to rugby and stuff, and these are young, like, 19, 20-year-old 20, 20 girls, and they're on a strict diet, and 
they're just running themselves into ground. They, they don't have anything else outside of rugby. And I see exactly what happened to me that one year, happening to some of these girls. Yeah. But you know, in their mind, that's what that's what they should be doing if they want to make it. So, yeah, I've kind of taken a little bit of that role myself this year, and um, it's just stepping in and trying to help these athletes and trying to show them that actually you're not going to perform to your best of ability on the field unless you're enjoying what you're doing yeah. off the field and having balance, not just rugby. Because yeah. if all of a sudden something happens, you get an injury, you don't get selected, what have you got to fall back on? Yeah. yeah. It's so hard though, eh? Because yeah. like I think about it's a it. a funny old road. Yeah, it's, it's, so, <laughs> it's so funny. It's like I wish... Yeah, I wish I knew what I knew now when oh, I was exactly. when I was young and and you know fit and, and quicker. But it just mm. life doesn't work that way. Nah. But it's um, you know, it's, I find it like I'm so grateful for those for those guys that helped me through that period. Yeah. Like I had some really like Lockie Crichton was huge for me. Oh yeah, yeah, he was really really good. Isaac Boss was another one, good tote man. Yes, yeah, he was he was Fussy. awesome for me because yeah. he might have been the next youngest player in the squad when. I first joined Waikato as oh, like right. a 17, 18 year old yeah. and Bossy was maybe 23 or 4 at the time. So it was quite a big age gap and, you know, at 17, 18, you're not mature, you're an idiot. Like, mm. you know, I didn't even... <laughs> Aren't we? Yeah, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know how to catch a, like I said, I didn't even know how to catch a taxi yet yeah, or anything yeah. like that. Like, had no life skills <laughs> yeah. whatsoever and all of a sudden I'm in, involved in this high pressure situation yeah. high where you're, you're playing on live TV and then... Yeah, it's very it's very easy for it to just all come down on you like yeah. a ton of bricks, and you don't know how to deal with it. And it's yeah. good, so good having the I guess the senior players around you mm. to help deflect that and just be like, that's not important. Mm. Don't worry about that. We'll just focus on this bit here. It's like yeah, so yeah. I'm extremely grateful for for the people that I had helped me through that, and that's why it's been such a big push for me later mm. in my career to to help help the younger guys. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, cool. So, talk to we're talking there, I guess, about balance, and I want to talk about your current lifestyle. So, mm. your brother told me to talk to you about this because he's <laughs> you're a qualified teacher, yeah. but you don't see yourself as a career teacher. No, like that's not. Do you want to talk us through that <laughs> and, and and your lifestyle that you got set up now? Because he yeah. said he thinks it's mint. He yeah. thinks it's like it's awesome. So yeah, it's good. So, um, the thing I guess I guess lay a platform as well. Um. For for men's rugby, when you first come into academy and stuff, you do the morning trainings and the evening trainings and, and kind of grind it out. Then as you kind of get up in the levels, might have 10 in season, you train during the day more. Yep. And then obviously when you become a Chiefs or the All Blacks, that's your job, that's your yep. full-time job. You train during the day. For the woman, it's a little bit different. So it um, doesn't matter what level you're, you're at. So I'm obviously um, been through... Schoolgirls Club, FPC, and now Black Ferns, we still train 6 a.m., 6 p.m., All right? So we've still got the, the day kind of to um, get some work in and stuff. So, um, yeah, I became a qualified teacher a couple of years ago um, and tried it out. <laughs> it was all right, but um, I, I do like teaching, but it is very full on. Yep. Um, people kind of don't see exactly what teachers well, do. Well, it's not nine to three, is it? It's hundred like, percent yeah. not nine to three. It is much more than that. So, um, yeah, at the moment, I'm I'm doing my trainings and I'm doing some relief teaching at Boys High, at your old stomping ground, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's just it's working out really well for me. I can kind of um, choose how many days a week I do, and um, yeah, still if I'm feeling pretty fatigued from the games and trainings because. It gets a bit much or whatever. I can pull back on my hours and yeah, and and I I just think um, you know, there's I've chosen that lifestyle. Um, I could go and do full time and get my um, reg in that, but at the moment, man, rugby is just such a short window. You never yeah. know when it's going to be over. So yeah, that's kind of where I've headed with that. Yeah, and I think that's important for people to understand too. I guess they haven't been through the the rugby. I guess professional mm. sort of era or level and, and how much time that goes into to yeah. wanting to achieve and to wanting to be at the top like you're in the black friends like you don't want to give up that jersey nah. you know you want to make the most of that opportunity for that period of time and exactly. for me it was the same like I've, I've been a professional since effectively since I was like 17 mm. you don't have time like I never had time to to get a trade behind me to nah. not even to study because I 
right i started to study and then it just rugby just took off and all yeah. of a sudden i was i had a i was a um, New Zealand Academy of Sport carded athlete so mm. my studies were getting paid for mm. but then because of my sport I failed because of attendance yeah. because I went to a <laughs> under 21 World Cup at the time so yeah. it was like well you've missed all these days so you failed so you've actually got to pay for your papers that you yeah. missed but I was like but my sport was the yeah. reason why but yeah so it was just it just rugby just took off yeah. and I had to fully invest or otherwise I was going to miss that opportunity yeah. and yeah and here I am now you know, for sort of at the tail end of my career, and I don't have any qualifications yeah. except all these amazing skills that I've learned from rugby, but there's exactly. no piece of paper that says, oh, yeah, Dwayne's qualified in this. Like, mm, mm, yeah, I so. guess, yeah, for, for you, you're, the men's rugby, there's a lot more games and stuff, obviously, yeah. going on. Um, For me, yeah, Black First Tours, are, we usually do two or three a year, but, um, yeah, my degree was meant to be a three-year degree, and it took me eight years to do. So yeah. I just ended up being a lot more kind to myself um, yeah. in terms of uh, going to part-time when I needed to because of rugby, um, trying not to put so much pressure on myself. You know, I, I go back to that one really bad year I had, and I was trying to hold down full-time study at the same time. Yeah. So that all just got on top of me. And, um, yeah, I kind of pulled back. I... Um, yeah, you went to part time. Still made rugby a focus, and that's kind of the kind of lifestyle I'm living now. Is is still kind of in that mindset, like um, trying to be more kind to myself, not trying to go out there and do too much and um, build this amazing big career at the same yeah. time, which I know a lot of women do, and it's amazing. Yeah. But um, for me to keep that balance and to stay really happy, um, yeah. yeah, I've got to find what works best for me and. At the moment, it's doing what I'm doing. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's good. It's it's such a key word. Like, I think mm. not only in sport or it's just life in general, just being balanced. Like, oh, 100%. And I think it's, as humans, we're not good at it. No. You know, like we, like we both went through it when we started, like we had those years where we just got consumed by rugby yeah. and then it was more my balance was out of whack mm. and... Yeah, and it took me to go overseas and understand how much I missed my friends and family. Yeah. So all of a sudden when I came back, as more time's invested in that. So I yeah. think with um, you know, mental health too has become um, a lot more or at the forefront of our discussions, which is awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm a big advocate for, for talking about that stuff as well and, um, and understanding that, that the balance is important, having those people around you and being... Um, yeah, for for me, like the the balance is I could I could go and push myself um, and be so busy and, and tied up with everything and yeah I might I might get further faster in my um, career outside of rugby, yeah. but am I going to be really happy and um, being able to spend time with my friends and my fiance and stuff doing it? And if the answer is no, then I'm not going to go and do that because that's going to sacrifice my mental health and yeah. and my well being. So yeah, that's yeah. the decisions I've made there. Nah, cool. All right, so we'll stay on the on the word of balance. So I want to talk about the balance of playing lots of sports when you're younger. So yeah. it's something that doesn't happen as much now. Like ours, well, I can't say our era because I'm ten years older than <laughs> you. But so like when when I was growing up, we just did everything. We got into everything. Yeah. We tried everything. You know, I, there wasn't a sport that I didn't give a go. Where now it seems to be kids are kind of, I guess, just. Maybe because there is a professional option mm. now that they're locking in a bit younger and a bit earlier and like, no, nah, yeah. that's what I want to do. I want to be an all-black or I want to be an all-white or whatever. There doesn't seem to be that balance. Do you, and I understand you had a very balanced mm. upbringing and, um, you know, you've you played cricket, basketball, touch, soccer, athletics. Yeah. Like, was yeah. that an important part for you but also for your rugby career, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Like, like you said, kids specialise so early now. And I'm just, yeah, I'm not sure sure if um, it's kind of the way to go. Um, yeah, for me, like you said, I grew up playing everything under the sun. And I think mostly that was because my mates were doing all different sports and I just wanted to hang out with my mates yeah. every day after school. Yeah. But it also just gives you a completely different skill set. Um, you know, you play football and, and you're much better at kicking and your hand-eye coordination is always getting better. But... Um, yeah, you learn about other sports too and you get to meet people from all different backgrounds and kind of see what it takes to um, be professional at whatever um, yeah. sport you may, may choose. So 
and at the end of the day, you, you really find out what, what you really love. So for yeah. me, that was rugby, but I didn't specialise until, yeah, after leaving high school. Yeah, I think now I kind of feel too that <clears throat> um, professional rugby's almost in a way is almost forcing it, which is quite mm. a strong word to use, like the word force. But yeah. some of these, like some of the boys now are getting contracts that's, you know, 16, 17 years old, NRL clubs are scouting them. So all of a sudden the Super Rugby franchises are like, we need to get this yeah. kid. So we're making, we're forcing a whole lot of pressure onto kids. Yeah, definitely. You know, like in having to make a decision. So mm. if you think at 16, like if I, if I knew at 16 I had to be ready to go, I'm, I wouldn't be still playing cricket at, mm. you know, sort of 14, mm. 15. I'd be like, nah, I need to spend as much time as I can playing rugby. Yeah, so well, first first 15 teams, eh? Like, yeah. they don't have time to play any of the sports with the nah. amount they train. Yeah. I mean, I'm at Boys High, which is yeah. one of the top schools in the country, so I see it firsthand, mm. um, what these what these boys do. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a bit different from when I went through. Yeah, <laughs> like, nah, like, they're we, very serious. We train Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do any off-field training, so, like, no weights or yeah. extra fitness sessions that was done in your own time if, yeah. if you wanted to push yourself and... We all train first and seconds together on a Tuesday, and we'd, yeah. and we'd split. And first and seconds would train separately on a Thursday and have a team run, and and that, that was, was it. it. And yeah. yeah, I just yeah, I feel that they are massively overtrained, and and mm. I do feel a lot of those kids get into that position that me and you were in at mm. twenty. Well, I was twenty one, and you know they're getting into that position at sixteen, seventeen years old, and they're coming out and they've either made it or they haven't and they're like they've fallen out of love with rugby yeah yeah, yeah it's, they're it's just interesting. like i'm not putting my body through that anymore i don't yeah. actually enjoy it yeah yeah it's interesting and then yeah. of course it's seeing when the boys first come out of high school the contract is straight away and, yeah. and I, I just i just wonder if they they are doing anything else you know yeah. aside from rugby and stuff so yeah, yeah. it's yeah. interesting yeah it is interesting we could go down a big rabbit hole yeah. with that topic, <laughs> yeah. but we won't. So you do a lot of training at Pirate Stadium now because you, you live close by. <laughs> I do. Yeah, yes. and you were very good at discus and shot put <laughs> growing up with your athletics career. Oh, uh, curse you, Nate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Pirate Stadium was a bogey, bogey venue for you. For one event. One yes. event, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but do you really want me to tell you yeah. how unfair it was? Yeah, I do. Well, oh, so discus every year, right? Would would get to the Waikato Champs and yeah, I'd I'd kind of say that I should hopefully have been the favourite to win it. And every single year I would do three no throws, which if you don't know discus, it means when it doesn't go in the vector lines, yeah. right? So, but the thing was there was a big metal cage around the outside, and I'm a left hander, and I don't know if you can picture this, but the metal cage that was supposed to be like a kind of U shape went in on the left hand side. So every time I massive disadvantage. Oh, she drew a huge. diagram in my book. I do it drew a diagram. <laughs> I wish you guys could see it. Because it was so unfair. And as you can tell, I'm over it. But um Yeah, a bit of a bogey ground there for me with the discus. But um Yeah, I go down there and do speed training now, so I don't even look at the discus ring. Yeah. It keeps me keeps me sane not having to look at it and have those yeah. old traumas right. be brought up. Yeah, now Thanks that I've that. brought it back up, yeah. you're gonna hate me when you go back and train yeah. there you know what you know what i feel like doing going to get a discus and just seeing if i could actually get it out onto the field once <laughs> <laughs> all right cool all right so i do want to talk about um like nate's come up a lot through this conversation and like being your older brother and how awesome is that story that he jumped on a plane with yeah. you and went over obviously got a very close family and you and nate are obviously very close mm. like how important have they been for you through your career yeah, um, I've been really lucky. I've got he's my only brother. He's only a year older than me, so we were so close growing up. Um, we fought a lot, but um, as we've gotten older, we've stayed really close. We live around the corner from each other, and um, he has now married one of my best friends from rugby. Um, so my first tour of um, with the New Zealand Sevens was with her, Jordan Webber. So, um, yeah, her brother Joe Webber's still playing for um, New Zealand Sevens and Bay of Plenty. Um, so, yeah, they live around the corner and, and they've given me my two beautiful nieces who I'm so close with. And, yeah, I'm, I'm forever grateful for everything that Nate and Geordie have done um, for me 
um, in my whole career, especially in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's very cool. If you follow Chelsea on Instagram, <laughs> you'll you'll see Hay- it's Hayley Hayes. Hayden. Oh, Hayden. Yeah, Hayden. 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 Yeah. yeah, Hayden. She pops up a lot. She's a lot, so yeah. cute. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, cute. She's, she's three cute. going on 13 at the moment. Oh, though. is she? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, they're, they're kind of keeping me um, entertained because obviously with me um, playing rugby, it's pretty hard for women to kind of pick and choose when you're going to have a kid and um, yeah. whether you're going to be able to bounce back for it. So from yeah. it. So I just um, go steal those kids for yeah, the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, um, I, that's like an interesting dynamic too, it I is. find. It's just it's, like... It's hard. It's hard, eh? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. very hard. If the male could carry the baby, I would yep. probably have one. Yeah, <laughs> but I can it's sense not could. the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he it's would if him. he could. Yeah. But nah, he can't. I reckon, yeah, yeah, I reckon he could. Yeah. Yeah. He, he would sacrifice a lot for you, I think. With your, <laughs> so you could excel through your career as a great oh, man. Oh, yeah. Sense. He would, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> the world doesn't work like that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. Um, just on that, what what's it like having your fiance as a head coach? Oh, yeah. Um, well, he. You guys he, talk at dinner at home. <laughs> <laughs> we put two different hats on. Okay, cool. we've got our rugby hat and we've got our relationship hat, which is quite good. Yeah. But um, he was my coach before. <laughs> Should I be saying this? <laughs> he was my coach for Waikato before we actually got together. So yeah. um, we'd had that player-coach relationship before. And, um, yeah, coming into this year with him being head coach and then me being named as captain as well yeah. um, through player votes, yeah, by yeah, the way, yeah. no, <laughs> from him right. just picking it. That's, that's um, pretty obvious. Yeah, it's been a new, um, yeah, new experience, but um, I think um, it's been going really well. Um we're very transparent um, as both a, a captain and a coach and um, as a relationship. So um, there's going to be people that um, aren't comfortable with it, not in our team environment, but um, other people who just see it on paper, I guess. Yeah. But for us, it works really well. Um, we're both massive code heads. So, yeah. so um, yeah, we kind of have to limit the amount, amount of time we talk about rugby, but... Yeah. For us, it always kind of ends up back there at the, yeah. at the dinner table. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's good. I'm enjoying it. No, it's cool. It's so cool when you're, like, passionate about something and yeah. you share that passion. Mm, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's it's healthy, I feel. Yeah. like if Or it's healthy in life to have passions and things yeah. that you're passionate about. And it's pretty cool that you guys can share that passion for, yeah. for the game of rugby. Honestly, though, on a Saturday morning, you would not know who was playing the game because oh, yeah. he is like imagine. 10 times more nervous than me. I have banned him from having coffee on game day because yeah. he's just like a little like, he's just so anxious when he's head coach. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, man, just chill out. It's all good. Like, you've done your job. I'm yeah, the yeah. one that has to play now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As being a captain, like, I know how important that head coach-captain mm. relationship is, and I was lucky enough to to be captain when John Gibbs was the head coach, yeah, and we had that I've player that was... relationship um, because we played together. He was mm. my captain when I first came in the team, so I had a lot of respect for him. Mm. He's a man that has, a, like, so much mana in our region and, well, I guess in the, in the, in the whole country, but he was someone, like, I just found... We connected really well as yeah. um, captain and, and head coach. And it is a very different relationship. And yeah. it wasn't something that I realized until I actually was a captain mm. that how different it is. Like you do, you've almost got to be like, he, he actually said it to me, like you've got to be separate to the locker room. You can't just be locker room swings all the time yeah. because the, when you need to put your foot down to the boys and say, this is what we need as mm. a team or this isn't going well or you just want to demand something of them, there has to be that respect yeah. there. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a hard balancing act, eh, the it leadership is. side of things. It is, and I'm learning so much. Like, um, I'm lucky enough for this to be my third year as captain, and um, the first year I was captain, I was probably terrible, like, just because you don't know what you don't know. And no, over just like the years, you ate pies before your first oh, game. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, if I saw the girls doing that now, oh, <laughs> watch out. Yeah. No, nah, but um, with, with captaincy, yeah, I've kind of watched who I look up to as leaders in our game. So in the Black Ferns, Fia Ulfa Masili, and now Leslie um, Elder, and then some of the other girls, Carla Hohepa and, and co, um, and just see how they lead through their words and their actions. 
And um, yeah, I think over the years, last few years, I've, I've been learning a lot about how to have that really good relationship with the coach um, as a player, but um, be a voice um, for the girls as well. And yes, I get what you say with the locker room chat. Like yeah. you want to be mates with everyone, yeah. but at the same time, you've got to kind of you've got to be that person that can pull the team in when you need to. And um, yeah, I'm constantly learning, and I'm constantly wanting to get wanting to get better in there because I really enjoy the challenge of leadership. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, it's it's something that I never really, I guess, thought that I would ever do. No. Um, but yeah, once the opportunities sort of came and. I don't know whether I got the role because of my age or what, but <laughs> when I came back Just in the 2000, token, who's the oldest? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> back in 2017, like the team was, yeah, they were so young. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I guess, the only one that really had a, a lot of experience. And mm. yeah, I just found it, yeah, I just found it so interesting. Like yeah. it was such a, and I and I guess at that stage of my career too, it was something new again. Yeah. So it, was, it sort of sparked a, you know, we, probably got another couple of years out mm. of me because I was just so keen and interested to learn and, you know, working out that dynamic and yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's something that I definitely enjoyed. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, I'd say it's definitely sparked me yep. um, up, back up a lot this year just because, yeah, we do have young girls coming in and um, you kind of feel a sense of responsibility to, to make sure those girls are, are doing well in the environment and make sure they're comfortable and they're learning the right plays and stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just seeing those girls I mentioned before, the way they lead by example, yeah. I'm just, um, I've kind of put a bit more pressure on myself this year to make sure I do that and yeah, just tr- just try and be the kind of best leader I can um, for now. And I know I've still got lots to work yeah. on, but yeah, enjoying enjoying the challenge at the moment. Yeah, well, I think you've got the right mindset in terms mm. of how you spoke about wanting to be there and support those younger mm. players, like that came through earlier yeah. when we were talking. And now that you're a captain, like how cool is that, that these young girls mm. come in, you are been playing FPC for 10 years, mm. you're a black fern, like they will be like you were with Emma Jensen, like they yeah. will. It's uh, just hard is, to think like that. It's funny to think, <laughs> yeah, eh? like, It is, yeah. yeah. I still don't see that. I, nah. I still feel like I'm quite yeah. young-ish mates with these yeah. girls and stuff. And I have um, James is quite good at reminding me sometimes that, um, you know, everything you do, people are watching you like these young girls are so yeah. um yeah I've kind of had to um take a look at myself and my behaviors and actions and realize that that maybe to some of these girls um I guess I kind of would be in that um position yep. yeah so yeah it's crazy to it think is yeah it's right, it is I feel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yep <laughs> yeah no nah, that's cool do you have any final thoughts for us just that you want to share no I guess just um yeah, it's been awesome yarning with you, Sweens, and um, yeah, I just hope to any kind of young players listening and and that that um, they can get something um, out of this in terms of like, especially that balance thing we talked about, yeah. Um, and yeah, just looking after yourselves and yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, no, it's cool. I uh, yeah, really want to thank you, Charles, for giving up your Wednesday night, um, <laughs> especially when Master Chef's on. Master Chef's on, and yeah. I have training and. About six hours. So. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you very much, Chelsea. No, I thanks. really appreciate it, and um, looking forward to watching you go this year in the FPC. So yeah, cheers. Thanks, Sweens. Sweet.